And uh, today we have the pleasure of having uh, Professor Jiang Hui Wang. Uh, he is from the uh, Southern Methodist Method University. He was a past editor in chief of the IEEE Transaction Smart Grid and a distinguished lecturer. And his uh, research focuses on smart grid, power system operation control, and grid resistance, cybersecurity. Thank you very much, uh, Jan Rui, and we look forward to the Thank you. Okay. 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 Uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me here. Uh, again, my name is Xian Hui Wang. I work at the Southern Methodist University uh, in Dallas, and it's my second time here. So last time I when I was here, it was like uh, eight years ago. So it's it's glad to be to be back. Today, my presentation is about the integration of hydrogen into energy systems. And I look at the three different aspects of this uh, uh, integration. One is the reliability assessment, the other is the optimal uh, operation and planning. So this is uh, the outline of my presentation. So uh, I'm gonna give you a general background about the hydrogen integration first. Now I'm gonna address this reliability assessment uh, problem uh, with uh, integrated energy system. Considering hydro, uh, we will look at this uh, optimal operation and the optimal planning of an integrated uh, energy system with uh, hydrogen. Then I will conclude with some remarks. So this is uh, the general uh, background of hydrogen uh, energy systems. And uh, you, you can see this is uh, from this report from IEA. Uh, the report is titled Hydrogen at Scale, H2 at Scale. So basically, it lays out this roadmap, this uh, uh, future about this hydrogen uh, uh, based uh, uh, integrated, energy, uh, integrated energy system. So you can see that uh, we have very uh, grand goals. And uh, they project that the total hydrogen demand it's going to in increase to um, uh, 528 million tons in 2050. You can see this, uh, that's a big number. And also we envision that hydrogen is gonna be used in uh, a lot of sectors in our uh, industries now. So the renewable RE is a renewable energy based on water uh, electrolysis is gonna uh, play a major role. So they're gonna help uh, mitigate the renewable energy curtailment which we are having now, and also is gonna help with the realization of net zero emissions in 2050. So that's the goal. And also the hydrogen fractions in global natural gas system will increase to 15% uh, in 2030. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, that. The way that we use, use hydrogen, one of the ways is that we can blend that hydrogen into our natural gas system. So you have a mix of hydrogen and uh, natural gas in our gas pipelines. So you can burn that, you can use that. So, and uh, uh, we also have this goal, 62% of hydrogen from uh, electrolysis, 30% of hydrogen is gonna be used for electricity production and uh, and fuel by 2050. So you can see, this is the goal. This is uh, the, the goal that, then the issue that how you can achieve that goal. As you can see from this figure here, uh, hydrogen is used, uh, hydrogen is basically, is a coupling uh, connector between the electric power uh, infrastructure and also the gas system. And you can see that uh, because hydrogen can be generated uh, uh, from gas, uh, can be generated from, uh, uh, from, from electricity, and the hydrogen can be also used to generate the gas or generate uh, electricity. It's like a two-way energy flow. So that's the vehicle between the grid side and also the gas system side. So, and uh, this is the roadmap that our PVO people are talking about. So in the near term, uh, the uh, hydrogen is mostly uh, produced uh, using this uh, uh, steam methane reforming process, SMR. So basically you use uh, gas to generate uh, hydrogen. And uh, the second one is a grid electricity based uh, electrolysis. So we have uh, power from the grid 
to have uh, this uh, electrolyzer that you can uh, that, that you can split uh, the water into hydrogen. So, and also uh, in terms of transmission, transportation, we can use this uh, gases tube uh, trailer. And uh, also we have this uh, small scale hydrogen pipes. We don't have a, a long distance hydrogen uh, transportation pipes now, but uh, in one of the conferences that I went to uh, this year that uh, Europe is building this uh, intercontinental uh, hydrogen trans transmission and pack. Uh, very large time, large large scale project they are doing. So that can be uh, can be the future too. And also um, hydrogen can be blended uh, into natural gas system and uh, to be used now. So most of the industry is using hydrogen for now. But uh, in, over the long term, and uh, people have those kind of uh, futures. So hydrogen can be produced uh, through this uh, steam methane reforming with carbon storage. So uh, because when you use gas to generate hydrogen, you generate uh, CO2. So then you can see use uh, uh, CCS to capture and those CO2 and store that. And also uh, in the future, we're gonna mostly talking about the blue hydrogen. Hydrogen has different colors. You have blue, you have gray, you have different colors. Different colors means that they are generated by different sources, by different ways. So blue hydrogen mostly is a way of generating uh, hydrogen. So basically you use renewable energy to generate uh, hydrogen. So in the, in the entire process, there's uh, not much CO2 uh, involved. So this color are blue uh, hydrogen, so renewable energy uh, based uh, uh, electrolysis. Uh, and the high temperature electrolysis is also another way of doing that. And uh, uh, so uh, also we can use a, a liquid truck to, uh, to transmit uh, hydrogen and build this large scale like Europe, uh, those hydrogen pipelines. Uh, and, uh, and the hydrogen can be consumed by industry, by transportation, by building, by power generation. Okay, so we have those grand goals. So we have that uh, uh, roadmap, we have an mission, uh, how you can, uh, you can get there. So that's the question that we are trying to address here. So along the road, you're gonna have a different uh, technical barriers, different technical challenges that you're gonna uh, encounter. So I'm gonna talk about several of the topics that we can think of now, and we are trying to uh, uh, solve now. So one of the topics is, um, is, a, is a dynamic energy flow of integrated energy system due to issues associated with uh, computational accuracy and efficiency. Because when you talk about the integrated energy system, you have, uh, you have uh, electrons uh, that can travel at the speed of light. You also have this gas uh, flow, you have hydrogen flows. They all uh, travel at a, at a different uh, quantity. So then how you can model the, the flows of those different uh, uh, energy sources. And also when you couple, when you integrate all those uh, systems uh, together, so you're gonna look at uh, the overall picture, the combined picture. So when you combine different sources, different uh, components, how can you evaluate the overall performance of the uh, of the combined system? And what's the reliability impact of those hydrogen on your traditional power system on the side from the gas system side, how you can evaluate that reliability as a result of integrating a lot of hydrogen into the uh, overall picture here. And also uh, all those uh, electrolyzers, so they have different operating states, which I will talk about uh, later. They have different, uh, I mean, feasible regions that uh, the, 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 the region they can be operating in. And also they have technical constraints associated with uh, electroly uh, electrolyzers. So all those uh, needs to be taken into account when you solve this uh, problem. And also when you blend the hydrogen into the, uh, into the system, it's gonna create, create this uh, reliability problem. And how you can optimize the overall system, how you can uh, optim uh, the planning from the planning from the operation point of view, how we can optimize the entire process so that you can have this robust power uh, gas hydrogen integrated energy system. It's a PGA, that's what we call it. Okay, so we have those different uh, topics so then we are trying to address uh, each of those uh, through this seminar. So the first one is the reliability assessment of an integrated uh, energy system uh, considering hydrogen. So this is basically a system configuration that we have here. So we have a, a green hydrogen is, uh, as I mentioned, is produced by renewable energy with uh, zero CO2 emissions. 
So we have those uh, green hydrogen O2, which does not uh, uh, have any simple emissions right here. Then electrolyzers, they cannot use the uh, energy from those green uh, energy sources to generate the uh, H2, hydrogen. Hydrogen can be put into energy, uh, hydrogen storage here in the, in the middle. Do you see my mouse? Yeah, okay. Here, here. Uh, let me see a pointer. It's uh, into energy storage here. And this uh, hydrogen can be uh, used uh, through this uh, methylation process to generate this uh, synthetic uh, natural gas. So this natural, natural gas can be blended into the natural gas uh, system that we have now. I mean, there's no requirement for additional um, infrastructure extension to use hydrogen for now. You can just blend that into the current uh, pipelines that you have. So as you can see, this is uh, one way of using, uh, using this is the dominant way of using hydrogen now. So I mean, if, when you do this, so you can see that uh, in the past, you have uh, this uh, natural gas system only. Now you are blending another different uh, gas into the natural gas pipelines. How that is how is that gonna affect your overall system performance in terms of reliability? So that's what we care about. Reliability we uh, here refers to the uh, to the to the, uh, the level of reliability of a power system, the overall load. The load can be uh, electrical load, it can be hydrogen load, it can be gas load. So when you curtail lo lo those loads uh, in some scenarios, you have a reliability problem, right? So we want to maintain the highest level of reliability, meaning that we want to maintain uh, no load is being uh, curtailed at uh, any times uh, as as best uh, I mean uh, as we can. So that, that's our goal here. But you have this uh, overall system. Then we're going to evaluate the reliability of this command system. So there are uh, different uh, ways to monitor. Uh, to model this uh, gas flow. So normally there are three type of uh, uh, equations. One is so-called state uh, equation here. Basically, state equation is used to uh, establish the uh, relationship between the gas pressure, density, temperature, and the other gas and type related uh, physical properties. So you can see when basically you can uh, you can measure, uh, you can use this value is that the average molecular weight of the gas you have. And then the gas can be a mix of a gas sources, right? So you have gas uh, fractures here. So, and it can be a mix of hydrogen and, net, uh, and the natural gas. And then also you have this uh, compressibility factor, uh, meaning that how, how the gas can perform from the real gas. And also you have the equations that can represent the temperature uh, pressure. These, these are all the important uh, characteristics associated with uh, uh, natural gas pipelines. So when you model the gas flows, you have to consider all those uh, factors, uh, temperature, pressure, et cetera. So, and when you blend the hydrogen into the overall mix, then all those, per, all those parameters are going to be changed. So because you, you are blending another source of uh, um, gas, so that's the reason that the state equation has to be changed. And another equation is called the continuity equation. So because it's a flow, flow it's, it flows uh, uh, continuously, so you have this continuity uh, equation, which basically uh, uh, ensures it's a principle of conservation. And if you assume the temperature and the compressibility factor remain constant, which is uh, the general uh, assumption we take in this kind of a calculation, you can use this uh, a partial differential equation to represent this uh, continuity equation. We also have uh, another equation is called a uh, uh, momentum equation. Basically, this represents all forces acting, uh, acting on the uh, gas um, particles. So here we assume the pipes are horizontally um, placed. And, uh, and also there's a very limited uh, solution error associated with the inertia and the kinetic energy. So if you also uh, use uh, this uh, uh, volume uh, metric uh, gas flow rate, uh, F, then you can simplify this equation as this. Still, those two equations, they are partial differential equations. Uh, readily solvable. So then you have to figure out a way how to kind of simplify that. So the way we do this is through this um, uh, back difference method. So you can use those uh, uh, differential equations to, to approximate that, uh, that equation that you saw earlier on, on the other slide. So once you do that, so you can simplify those equations. Those equations uh, can be uh, much easier uh, solved. 
And also you have this uh, continuity equation, which is also simplified. And also the equation, and also the LAMPAC, uh, LAMPAC uh, 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 issue. LAMPAC meaning that you have, because natural gas, you're gonna have some residual natural gas uh, in the pipeline, right? So, because when you flow the pipeline, when you take the gas from the pipeline, there are a certain amount of gas that are still being stored in the pipeline. So that's called a lamp pack. You can think of that as kind of a storage capability. So you have certain natural gas uh, being stored in the use. So that's kind of a, the, the represent the amount of gas stored in the pipeline and it's very important for emergency conditions because it can be used as a storage kind of a, a device. So when you need that, you can use that residual gas uh, for those emergency conditions. And um, so you have those three equations now. And also, if you uh, if you look at, uh, if you uh, discretize the gas flow by dropping this uh, continuity equation and the land pack the flow uh, equals outflow, you have this uh, steady state gas flow equations. Basically, and this is a, a simple version of a dynamic uh, gas flow that I introduced uh, earlier. So this is that the state gas flow uh, is, is a simplification of that uh, uh, of, of a dynamic gas flow. So you have this backward difference equation as shown here, and you have momentum equation shows here. So this is a uh, this is a version that's mostly um, uh, uh, computational. Uh, com uh, so you can solve those static gas flow more efficiently than natural gas, than dynamic gas flow. But this will introduce errors, which we will talk about uh, later in our results. So then you have three sets of equations. Um, those are state equation, continuity equation, and the momentum equation. And you also have two versions of a gas flow. One is a dynamic, it's a steady state a gas flow, okay? So then we're gonna look at how those are kind of forming uh, modeling techniques will perform uh, your results and how we can simulate the, the system through those uh, equations. And uh, all those equations, uh, I mean, some equations can be even further simplified, like a momentum equation can be even further simplified by linearizing uh, uh, those equations. And uh, those steady state gas flow models will provide this uh, uh, benchmark that we're gonna uh, compare uh, against. So you have this uh, benchmark, the basic scenario is a steady state gas flow, which is uh, uh, what people normally use now. You don't consider any dynamic. Uh, those are continuity, uh, continuity equation. You don't consider land back. You have this statistic gas flow. But this is a most coarse uh, way of modeling this gas flow. But we're gonna compare with this. Uh, so then we we have this uh, overall uh, overall uh, problem to minimize overall uh, uh, overall uh, uh, renewable energy curtailment and uh, overall power and gas. Uh, uh, curtail. So you can see that uh, we have this minimize this overall uh, energy not served and also subject to a, a number of constraints. We have uh, power to hydrogen and methane uh, constraints. Power to, uh, you can see a different constraint here. We also have a po bulk power system constraint too. We have a natural gas system constraint. So you have a number of constraints uh, cutting across different systems in your uh, overall optimization problem. So then you define this. So these are very commonly used in uh, power system uh, uh, industry now. I mean, especially in the, the top two. The first one on the power system side is called the loss of load, uh, loss of load probability. So basically it tells you the probability uh, of you losing some load. And then you can define that at the system level and the bus level. And also you can have this uh, uh, EDNS, uh, expected load not uh, supply. We also de define at the system level and also at the bus level, okay? So this tells you how reliable your system is. It tells you how good your system reliability is, okay? And also you can define the, those indices similarly for gas system too, and you have a loss of gas probability and the expected gas not subsupply, uh, e.g. in S. And uh, for the wind farm, you have loss of a renewable, just using wind as one example here, loss of a renewable energy probability and the amount the expected uh, are in not, uh, not supply, ERNS. So we're gonna run a number of cases uh, trying to calculate all six different uh, indices. So this is the way we run the simulation. So this is a, um, uh, this is a flowchart of that. So we use the sequential Monte Carlo. So basically 
you run the system because we're trying to talk about the reliability, you run the system over a long time horizon. So here, our system over a year. So you have an entire year, and then you cannot run the entire year all at once. You have to kind of divide and conquer. You divide the entire year uh, into, uh, in our case, into 52 weeks. So you run one week at a time. When you first the first week, then you run a second week. You you keep going. So you can see that uh, this is uh, the loop that represents the, the way that we we roll the simulation by week. You first you the first week, and then you go to the second week. We solve the, uh, the problem using this two stage uh, optimal energy uh, shining approach. So in the first stage, we get this coarse solution, which is a steady state gas flow. The second stage, we are using this more detailed uh, dynamic gas flow. So then you run this loop uh, for a year, then you're gonna calculate the variance of energy now served. Uh, this data that we have here. So once you have the threshold uh, delta mean, then if the, the calculation of delta is le less than you predefined, then the then we say the the, the 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 competition has converged. Then you can generate all those six reliability indices. So this is the, the test system that we are using here, and this is a uh, this is a synthetic uh, system. Now basically, we don't have a real system now, and uh, so this is the HP twenty four bus uh, power system, and we also add that uh, twenty node natural gas system into the uh, mix. Couple of the system now, and uh, on the power system side, we have on the power system side, we have twenty two uh, conventional generators. Three wind farms uh, with uh, P2 uh, hydrogen and methane uh, systems. And we have three wind farms here, and we have a natural gas uh, system here. So, as also, we model the outage, um, I mean, for each component in the system. So, we run very detailed uh, uh, Monte Carlo simulation for every uh, component in the system. So, when you're in cases, we want to see that uh, through kind of a detailed, I mean, uh, a case study. How can we uh, uh, how can we uh, uh, see the different uh, reliability uh, performance under different scenarios under different uh, modeling uh, assumptions? So you can see we have uh, three cases here. Uh, first case C zero is a dynamic gas flow with uh, P two HM and hydrogen effects. Hydrogen effects is where you have those uh, uh, physical characteristic change uh, when you blend the hydrogen into the gas network. Okay. So we have a dynamic gas flow with a P2 uh, HM and the hydrogen effects. That's our proposed model, which is, which is uh, I mean, pr pr presumably is gonna be the best model. And then the second uh, case, C1, is a steady state gas flow with a P2 HM, but no hydrogen effects. You ignore that uh, if, uh, effects. And then the third case, C2, is a hydrogen gas flow with a hydrogen effects, but no P2 HM. Here. And you can see that, uh, uh, all those three cases can convert uh, using this uh, picture here, uh, convert over uh, 30 run, 30, 30 iterations. They can all uh, convert. The best reliability performance is observed in the proposed model. So we can see, because that's the most accurate uh, model. And, uh, and then the worst LMP, LOGP, and the other images occur in uh, C1. And then the worst LORP and ERNS occur in so they have different uh, 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 performance in uh, different scenarios. So then we want to look at the impact of a gas flow, uh, gas flow dynamics. So here, as I mentioned, so the, we really argue that you should use a dynamic uh, gas flow that um, better capture the flow, the movement of the gas in the in the pipeline. So and then we compare that with the steady state uh, natural uh, uh, gas flow, which do not consider. The, the 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 continuity equation and the lampack uh, uh, impact. You can see between the C three and the C four, you have very dramatic uh, difference uh, in terms of LOMP, in terms of LOMP, uh, uh, very different uh, performance across different uh, reliability indices. So now you can see that uh, the takeaway here is uh, this: if you use a different model, you're gonna have a different uh, uh, results. So you should try your best to use the best model, most accurate model. Right, so that's our goal here. So here we are saying that uh, through this number of uh, detailed case studies, it does give you different results if you choose to use, uh, to use a different model here. You can see that uh, in C3 and C4, we have a different uh, performance and uh, across different uh, scenarios. 
And also, uh, this is uh, this is where we increase the hydrogen uh, hydrogen fraction. So there is a 100% system in the first place. Then you are adding hydrogen into the mix, right? So you don't want to add hydrogen all at once. You want to add it, uh, you want to add hydrogen uh, and then a little by little. So we are adding that by 5% at one time and increase that penetration to 20%. So here, this is what we are doing. Again, as you can see, if you use a different uh, uh, representation of uh, gas flows, then the performance of, uh, uh, of reliability indices will be much different. You can see, you can see the difference in those uh, uh, blue curves and in those red curves, okay? You can see the difference here. So again, the, the, the key point is that so you should uh, strive to use the most accurate model as possible. That will give you a totally different uh, picture. As, as you can see here, if you use the C3, uh, which is the dynamic gas flow with hydrogen effects, the IOM, IOGP goes up. But if you use uh, C5, which is a dynamic gas flow without hydrogen effects, it actually goes down. Totally contradic contradictory uh, conclusion. So something you should be uh, mindful of. So given that you know all those uh, reliability effects by using uh, hydrogen in the system, how can you optimally uh, uh, I mean, schedule and operate the integrated uh, uh, systems? So here we want to look at uh, this uh, more comprehensive, uh, more comprehensive system configuration here. So here you can see that uh, we are adding heat picture here uh, because the heat is often the byproduct of the overall process here. As you can see, you can use the hydrogen uh, renewable to generate uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen here, and that's the water system also comes into the picture. We have water here and the water circulation system, and you can uh, exceed heat through here and to provide this uh, heating to the to the, to the the district uh, customers. Then you have this uh, electrolyzer, and the hydrogen can be put into storage, and uh, that hydrogen can be directly consumed by hydrogen uh, consumers right here. And also hydrogen can be used uh, through this uh, methylation process uh, to be blended into natural gas uh, system. So you can see, Hydrogen is kind of a uh, coupling uh, factor here. It connects with water, it connects with a uh, hydrogen customer, it, con it connects with renewable, it also connects with a uh, natural system here. So this is uh, the system that we are looking at. We are trying to uh, optimize the operation of such integrated system here. Yes. Okay, so then we throw in a bunch of uh, uh, formulations here. So we have this, uh, a combination factor here, which basically X represents the on and off uh, status of a of electrolyzer. So if it's on and it's one, if it's off, it's zero. Then you can see that we're trying to the feasible region of of uh, uh, electrolyzer using this uh, convex um, uh, methods, and then we have uh, this combination factor. We have uh, the power balance for uh, electrolyzer powerful hydrogen, uh, a powerful heat. Also, we have different uh, constraints associated with uh, electrolyzer uh, performance. This is for the temperature, and this is for the unique movement on and off equation for those uh, uh, electrolyzers. That was the hydrogen integration constraint. So you have power to hydrogen, uh, hydrogen storage constraint, hydrogen uh, consumption uh, uh, balance constraint also have this conversion between hydrogen and to methane, as you can see here. We also model the uh, conversion uh, if, uh, if, uh, efficiency through the, here, through this equation here. And also uh, hydrogen can be blended with methane into the system too. As you can see, this is the amount of hydrogen uh, into the pipeline. And this is the, 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 uh, the methane that you already have. And that this is the total uh, amount of gas that you, you have as a result of this combination. And uh, also you can represent the heat uh, transfer process here, which is uh, a capture the, the change of uh, electrolyzer temperature. Also you can uh, capture this uh, heat loss through this equation here. So we have those uh, detailed equations to capture this uh, electricity, also capture uh, usage, utilization, equations, constraints. Also we can capture the heat transfer process here. So the overall uh, objective function is to minimize the overall uh, cost. So uh, this cost here uh, can include the UC, uh, the unique minimum cost on the traditional 
power generation side because for every power generator, either it's a, a gas generator, coal, whatever you have, and associated with, uh, with when you start those generators uh, uh, from the beginning, it, it has a startup cost. When you shut them down, there's shutdown cost. When you operate them, there's a breaking cost associated with those. And also, you have this uh, natural gas cost too. So because when you burn gas, it incurs, it incurs the cost. And also we have this uh, uh, load not served scenario. So when you have this load not served scenario, you worry about uh, in the worst case. So that's the reason we use the kind of a robust optimization representation. And uh, here we are saying that uh, what's the worst case that you lose uh, uh, most of the load? And uh, what's the uh, uh, load can be uh, gas, can be heat, and uh, can, be, can be power. So when you calculate all those, so you overall objective is really to minimize your cost under those worst case scenario. So you want to try to uh, reduce the power being shared in those worst uh, case scenarios. And also you also want to reduce the overall operating cost. Again, we have a number of constraints here. Uh, this uh, power uh, to um, uh, uh, hydrogen to uh, and the methane uh, and heat constraints. And also we have natural gas uh, network constraint. We have a distribution network constraint, which maintains the nodal power balance. Uh, we use this dish, uh, flow model, node voltage and UC and linear design rules. And then for the heat side, we have this nodal heat balance constraint, temperature of a pipes and the temperature at the confluence uh, nodes. Okay, so then we run this uh, HB33 bus case, which is uh, slightly bigger than the previous case. And uh, here you can see that we are adding this uh, heat network into the uh, picture too. So you can see uh, those, uh, uh, those uh, red curves, red dots, those are the heat pipelines and heat networks, heat demands. So you have this uh, uh, natural gas um, pip uh, pipeline here, which is uh, represented in blue. You have uh, hydrogen, in, uh, you have a uh, power in black, and then you have a heat here, and uh, and uh, also you have we have we have renewables into the picture here. So if you squint hard enough, you can see this wind farms right here, uh, here, and uh, there's a wind farm right here. Okay. So now we have this uh, uh, it's an integrated uh, system that has a different energy flowing throughout. Okay. So again, we run a large number of, of cases, basically. That how each of the uh, case uh, uh, perform, and uh, which one is the best uh, kind of configuration that we are seeking. And for the S1 to S2, we have a steady state gas flow without hydrogen effects, uh, similar to our previous uh, case study of SH1 to SH3, which is steady state the gas flow with hydrogen effects. T1 to T3, and a dynamic gas flow without hydrogen effects. And uh, TH1 to TH3, uh, dynamic gas flow with hydrogen effects. So and for each group, and we slightly increase the hydrogen fraction uh, from ten to uh, from zero to ten to twenty. So trying to increase the fraction, the penetration of hydrogen into the gas network. You can see that uh, the total raw, uh, the total overall uh, operating uh, cost decrease with the increase of hydrogen uh, because when you add a hydrogen, you reduce the amount of gas you are burning. And has has uh, high cost. So when you add hydrogen here, and especially hydrogen is is uh, is produced by wind, which is a, a zero operating cost. So hydrogen comes at at free and no cost to you. So when you increase the amount of hydrogen in the overall uh, gas pipelines, you you are burning more hydrogen and the less gas. You are reducing the overall cost, which is uh, the benefits of using hydrogen here. And also the steady state of the gas flow uh, leads to different results. If you look at this uh, table on this side, they generate a different uh, uh, generation dispatch results. Those are the generators, command cycle units, electrolyzer, and gas well. And because you use a, a, a kind of a coarse resolution uh, gas flow model, you can have different results from the more accurate uh, dynamic gas flow model. And also, if you neglect those hydrogen effects, meaning that you, you ignore that's a physical property by blending those hydrogen because you, as I showed you earlier, so that's gonna change a lot of parameters uh, that they are used to describe the gas flows. If you blend hydrogen in there into the overall mix, you don't change those uh, uh, properties, those parameters 
then your, the results are going to be uh, misrepresented. So that's another point. So then we have, uh, look at this uh, reliability side, uh, operational side, we're going to look at the planning side. I really think myself, really think that uh, this kind of integrated uh, will be our future. So you are not going to deal uh, going to deal with a hydrogen system alone, and you are not going to deal with a, uh, I mean gas system alone. So in the in the future, it's going to be a combined a uh, combined uh, system, and uh, especially when you have hydrogen in the mix, because hydrogen could be a game changer, could be it's a coupling bridge between different uh, uh, different uh, energy sources, as I mentioned earlier. So when you have this uh, this uh, this uh, 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 overall integrated system, uh, that's what we call it a kind of uh, hydrogen hub. So all the other systems can be centered around, uh, can be centered around hydrogen because hydrogen can be used to convert two way back and forth between different uh, uh, energy uh, energy uh, sources, uh, between electricity, between gas, as I showed you earlier. So hydrogen can be the the the, the middleman here. So uh, that's the reason we call it hydrogen hub because. It's Hub. It's very uh, very convenient to be used because hydrogen can be easily blend into the gas network, can be transported through trucks, and can, can be generated locally. So if you can see, if you if you distribute your electrolyzer across your uh, across your uh, territory, then you can generate the hydrogen locally. It's like a DR, right? So it's, you don't have to uh, generate hydrogen in a centralized plant, which is another benefit of using being local, and also and it can be transported too. And also uh, in the future, we can have this high temperature uh, electrolyzer, which has much higher efficiency than the current uh, low temperature uh, electrolyzers uh, now. And the current uh, efficiency is 40 to 60. So in the future, if you use high temperature uh, electrolyzer, the efficiency can be much higher. And also the can be connected to the external power system here too. So here we are specifically looking at this, uh, the solar power plants. You have this uh, uh, CSPP um, plants here. And uh, CSPP plants, we have um, uh, thermal storage because it's gonna generate the heat. You have the solar uh, field that has uh, taken solar energy as the input to generate the heat and generate the power. Heat can be put into thermal storage here and it can be uh, used to supply the, your heat demand in your uh, district. Also can be used to generate the power through this power block, okay? That Power block can be used to uh, generate the power. Uh, electricity can be supplied to power system, and uh, and uh, those high temperature uh, electrolyzer can taken can can be taking power from the external power system to generate hydrogen too. So you can see that they are kind of an intertwined uh, system here. And uh, and then we have also another set of different equations to formulate all those uh, uh, constraints associated with uh, each of uh, of the sources. So we have a CSVP constraint because you have thermal here, uh, different from the PV panels, which does not deal with uh, heat. We have CSVP here that also has a seat uh, storage and the generating uh, capability. So we have seat thermal power balance constraint as shown here. And we have a power block output uh, constraint that can, be, uh, uh, that can be used to represent the power generation process here. We have thermal storage here. Uh, this is the state of the um, of that uh, storage device. And then we have a range of that uh, storage, upper bound, lower bound. And then we have this uh, high temperature uh, electrolyzers here. So, and uh, those high temperature electrolyzer will require thermal power input. We will require uh, electric power input. So those are represented through those two equations here. And also uh, they, are, uh, they, are, uh, they are going to uh, generate the power. I, I, and uh, for the overall operation of a uh, high temperature electrolyzer, you have power for hydrogen equations, and you have reserves, and you have stop and standby uh, uh, constraint, and multi state UUC problem. Here, the key point here is that so for those uh, high temperature uh, uh, electrolyzer, they have another state which is not on uh, or off. It can be run on this standby mode. So it can be sitting idle there and, uh, and, uh, and uh, so we have this multi-state UC unit commitment problem. You have a zero one and somewhere between zero and one. So that's done by uh, uh, equations. And they can be all represented through those equations here. 
And then, as I mentioned, so uh, this tells you this uh, kind of hydrogen model that I was talking about. So on the, uh, this is uh, your electrical bus. So you have external power grid connecting uh, uh, to this bus. And that can be connected to this bus too. Also, you have electrical demand also connected with this bus. This is your electrical bus. Also, you have this hydrogen hub um, bus, which is sitting in the middle. And then this um, bus, uh, this hub, uh, can be connected to a hydrogen network, uh, electrolyzer. And the electrolyzer is a bridge between the uh, electrical bus and the hydrogen hub. Also, you have fuel cell. Fuel cell. And also, you have hydrogen demand here. And uh, on the lower side, you have a natural gas uh, system. We have natural gas network, uh, natural gas demand. As I mentioned earlier, natural gas can be used to generate, uh, uh, generate hydrogen through this SMR, steam methane uh, reforming process here. And uh, also hydrogen can be used to generate the synthetic natural gas through methanation. Okay, you can see this overall picture here. Uh, and then, so for the uh, gas system, we use those equations here. And we can see those are the top two. They are used to represent this steam methane reformer, uh, how to use gas to generate uh, hydrogen. Also, you have hydrogen storage equations. And these uh, are the ranges, and these are state of the charge. And then we have those low temperature, uh, uh, low temperature electrolyzers too. So then, uh, uh, we have hydrogen pipe, uh, upper bound, lower bound, uh, hydrogen demand, uh, hydrogen to power to hydrogen, uh, from hydrogen equation and reserves. And those are the hydrogen uh, balance constraint here. So those hydrogen balance constraint, because hydrogen is a, it's, it's like a, a, uh, it's like a electricity. For the electricity, you have a Kirchhoff voltage law, you have a Kirchhoff uh, current law, right? So, and the hydrogen is the same thing. So you need to a conservation uh, uh, through up. So you have those uh, hydrogen balance constraints that can represent the uh, principle of conservation here. You have exchange the power, you have exchange the gas uh, between the hub and the external system. Okay, so because we are talking about this uh, investment planning problem, so we are talking about investment cost. So all those detailed uh, constants are going to uh, this uh, uh, formulation here. So. All those uh, co detailed constants are going to be to minimize the overall investment cost. So investment cost includes this uh, generator and the line investment cost. When you put up a generator, it has uh, this uh, capital cost. And then you have this uh, SMR and fuel cell investment cost, uh, electrolyzer investment cost, and hydrogen storage and pipeline investment cost. You also have this operating cost. So when you do your planning problem, you don't only focus on this investment cost. So you have front investment cost. Then when you're looking into the future, you need to simulate the, oper uh, the operation under each investment scenario uh, for the future years, right? So this is where you're gonna you calculate those operation costs. So those operation costs include the generator operation costs, power shedding costs, hydrogen uh, operation costs, and hydrogen shedding costs. And also gas web, and also spinning uh, reserve cost. The, the system, as a system planner and system operator, you always maintain certain uh, extra uh, redundant capability uh, in the system, uh, in anticipation of something that you have not foreseen uh, in the first place. Yeah. So those are the reserve are used for. Reserve can be used for power system, can be used for gas, can be used for heat, can be used for uh, for uh, any other any resources here. So these are common uh, measures that we, we take to emergency scenarios. Those are the reserve costs. And because you are using, uh, you are, uh, I mean, uh, accommodating those reserves, it's gonna incur this uh, spinning reserve cost. So you need to consider all those costs when you do your investment uh, planning problem. So then we consider this a problem. We have power system, hydrogen hub, and all those equations that every candidate uh, has a different uh, locations, uh, sizing, and uh, and technology issue, right? So, when you do your planning, either for uh, for power, for hydrogen, for gas, you have different uh, choices. You have you have uh, this SMR, 
you have a, you have an electrolyzer, you have a storage, you have fuel cell, you have pipes, you have a generator, you have a transmission lines. For every components, you have a you have a, uh, the challenge of picking the, lo uh, the location for that uh, particular component, picking the size for that uh, 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 picking, uh, to pick the timing when you build that. If your planning horizon is 10 years, you build it in the first year or in the second year or in the, uh, in the last year. Right? Also the types of technology you're gonna choose. So all those uh, have to be considered in your investment problem too. So those are the investment uh, constraints that you have here. So you can see this uh, the overall objective function is to minimize the overall cost. You're gonna uh, minimize overall investment cost, operating uh, cost. So the planning uh, constraint is location, size, and type. You're gonna pick from a certain uh, budget that you have. And um, also you have those uh, operation costs, all those the detailed constraints that I showed you earlier, uh, uh, CSPP and uh, the constraint, hydrogen hub constraint, uh, power system constraint, and then natural gas system constraint. Okay, so then we run this, uh, um, it's an uh, integrated system planning using 24 bus a case and uh, 20 uh, node natural gas system and four hydrogen hubs. And you can see that the four hydrogen hubs are sitting in the middle here because they can be uh, used as a bridge between uh, different uh, uh, energy systems. And you have a power system, hydrogen hub, a constant. We have two types of SMRs. And we have, a, we have a, a, a electrolyzers, fuel cell, and hydrogen storage. We have a natural gas system. We have different uh, two number, uh, two uh, gas well. I think pipes and then two compre compressors. And we have a demand in terms of power, gas, and the hydrogen here. So then you have a, you have a, 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 a demand that is known to you. So then you need to plan your system to meet that demand, right? So then we have three uh, cases here. A1 is uh, the proposed uh, stochastic pre uh, programming based uh, coordinated planning model. Here, we look at different scenarios because the future demand uh, fluctuating can be stochastic. So we use a storage, uh, we use the stochastic planning methods by assigning a probability to each individual scenario. Now you look at the overall picture, trying to get the uh, lowest expected cost. The second uh, approach, A2, is uh, only low temperature, those low efficiency, low temperature electrolyzers are used. And A3 is uncalled in the planning model without, uh, uh, without uh, electrolyzer cells. So then those are, this table shows you different uh, uh, performance in terms of cost, in terms of uh, the choice of uh, technology. As you can see here, A1 has the least total cost because that's the most optimized uh, way of building your integrated uh, system. A2, A2 is gonna increase the overall cost by 43 uh, million. And uh, A3 has highest total cost because it totally uncoordinated, or totally not totally uh, optimized. And uh, also you can see that 38% uh, of wind is gonna be curtailed in case three. So that, that's very bad scenario, right? Because it's not coordinated, it's not co-optimized. And those are the key points here. One of the key points that you can see that uh, the electrolyzer can really help the system because they can help or absorb the, the renewable energy. When you have surplus wind and surplus solar, uh, which you cannot use. You can use that supply wind and solar to uh, generate the solar for a long duration of time. Uh, because hydrogen, uh, another benefit of using hydrogen is that it can be stored for a long time. It's not like a battery. If you store energy in those batteries, it's gonna die out, right? So, but for the hydrogen, you put in the container in the tank, uh, it's gonna be there for a long time, which is good. And so those are electrolyzers can really help with this. Also, those are, uh, those are fuel cells can also uh, offer additional uh, electricity of hydrogen. You can use, you can use uh, uh, hydrogen to, uh, through fuel cells to generate the power. Also, those fuel cells, they are inverter-based uh, resources. So that can also provide great support to the overall system. So, and, and then we run to, uh, we want to kind of uh, look at the different uh, modern techniques associated with those uh, uh, electrolyzers. As I mentioned, so we have uh, the different uh, modeling kind of formulations. You have one state, just on, two states, uh, B2 case, just on and off, three states, and on and off, and uh, standby states. 
And also you have uh, two types of, uh, of uh, electrolyzers. One is a low temperature, low uh, efficiency. The other one is um, that you have uh, both. So as you can see, we run the case for different numbers that, uh, through here that uh, uh, the, the high temperature uh, electrolyzer can reduce the overall cost because it has a higher efficiency of running. Uh, our proposed model, those more detailed uh, uh, operating uh, state model of those uh, electrolyzers can reduce the total cost and it's more consistent with, uh, with the overall practice here. And this is the improvement uh, over the current uh, state of the art. And so we're trying to see that if we, our massive can scale to a larger system, then we, we go for this uh, 72 bus uh, HB case. Now we have a 40 node uh, natural gas system in hubs. So uh, uh, it's almost double the size, more than double the size of the previous system. So we run the case. Again, we run different number of cases and we got a, a similar conclusion here. And uh, you can see that the C1, which is our uh, proposed method, can still have the least uh, total cost. And uh, C2 and C3 will increase the overall cost by uh, 75 billion and the 436 billion. And then uh, the, the current of the wind is still very high, about 25% uh, right here. And also, the model can take a, a longer time to run because it's a lot much bigger, uh, much bigger uh, system here. It takes about 20 hours to run, but uh, which is still acceptable because you are running, it's a planning problem. It's gonna take years to build. It's not like an operation problem. You need to run it in real time. You need to get the results in the next five minutes. But for the planning problem, it takes years to build. So this, and uh, yeah, so, in conclusion, that I showed you that uh, the work that we have done recently, uh, we are learning this too because uh, hydrogen is a new topic to us, but uh, but not many people have looked into how we can integrate hydrogen into overall energy system operation. And then uh, and uh, we I think uh, we are uh, one of the first uh, to look at some uh, reliability issues associated with uh, such an integrated uh, energy system, how you can uh, run your optimal operation, your plan your system in an optimal way for this uh, such an integrated uh, system. I, I hope you have uh, learned something from here. And uh, so going to the uh, future, now that we have uh, a lot more work to do. And you can see that uh, we can do, uh, we, can, we, we can enhance this uh, reliability assessment. Um, and and uh, we, can, that, uh, we, can, we can do our op, uh, optimal op, uh, op, uh, operation better. And also we can, uh, do this optimal planning method. So there's a lot of things that we want to add to this tool, and we want to have this more robust optimization model that can consider this uh, uncertainty from wind and solar better. Because if your wind and solar is a source for your uh, hydrogen production, the uncertainty of wind and solar is going to affect your overall uh, hydrogen production in a big way. So we, we, we did not look into that in, uh, in much detail. That can be added into the future. And, uh, and also we did not consider any transportation. As I mentioned, so hydrogen can be put into these trucks, right? That can move around, that can move hydrogen from one point into another point. That has to involve this transmission networks, uh, modeling constraint. And we don't consider any of the other here. And that's gonna uh, throw in another uh, dimension of uh, difficulty and complexity into the overall uh, framework that I'm showing here. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I, I hope you have uh, gained something from here. Thank you.